Shaw Cable, dedicated to the community, service, and you, proudly presents Spotlight on UNBC, the University of Northern British Columbia. Brought to you in part by Northland Chrysler Jeep and Northwood Pulp and Timber Limited. Northland Chrysler Jeep, home of the number one selling minivan in North America, is located at 3rd and Vancouver in Prince George. Northland has been in business since 1984. Northland Chrysler Jeep is a proud sponsor of Spotlight on UNBC, a program designed to let you know what's happening at your university. Northland Chrysler Jeep, your Eagle and Dodge truck dealer, is where people make the difference. Northwood Pulp and Timber is a proud sponsor of Shaw Cable 10 and its volunteer-produced television programs. Northwood also supports UNBC. As a partner in progress, Northwood has donated $350,000 towards the scholarship fund. When matched by the government, it represents a contribution of $700,000. Hi, and welcome to Spotlight on UNBC number 8 for the month of October. My name is Robin Adderkum, and on this show, we're going to look at the next 300 and some days and what has to be done before UNBC can open for full operations. On September 8, 1994, classes will begin here and at regional teaching centers, and we'll look at what has to be done before that date. That's the feature story, and it's coming up next here on Spotlight on UNBC. on UNBC with your host Rob Van Adricum. At this point it's hard to believe this campus will open one year from now but the asphalt has been laid and every day something else gets done. Each day also brings us that much closer to the grand opening at UNBC and the university will evolve more in this one year than it ever will. We have five or six major projects that we have to undertake and we have to make sure that they all come together just in time for uh, our opening. One is the uh, construction project. That's now in phase two, well underway. Uh, it's actually looking very good on the site now. Where the, there are pipes going in and finishing going up, and it looks like it's really, uh, it's really coming to, uh, to completion. Uh, another is the uh, hiring project. We have uh, uh, 40 faculty already hired, and we need to hire another 100 and, uh, 110. Then we have to get all our systems uh, up in place. So we have to get a, a registration system, a financial system, and uh, all of the computer hardware and software to go with it uh, all, all ready and running uh, smoothly. Uh, then, of course, we uh, all have to move from our temporary quarters into the permanent uh, quarters. And we'll have to phase that with different uh, uh, units of the university going up at different uh, times but we should be able to do that uh, reasonably uh, smoothly. Not all will be on site uh, for opening. We'll leave them where they are so that they can operate uh, smoothly without having to go through the adjustment of, uh, of, uh, of fitting into new quarters before they get there. Yeah, so lots to do. Oh, there's a great deal to do. Well, one of the major challenges for the academic side for next year is to take the calendar as a starting point. Uh, it explains what courses are offered, it explains what programs we're going to offer, what degree opportunities UNBC will make available. So that's a good starting point. Uh, now we have to find the faculty that will teach the classes. Uh, we have to have the, find the, 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 the program chairs that will operate the programs um, and make sure that we provide the facilities necessary. If you're offering a chemistry class, you need a chemistry lab. If you're offering a history course, you've got to make sure the library provides the services you need to back that program up. If you're going to offer a nursing program, you've got to make sure again that you have the appropriate facilities in place. So our challenge for, for this next year is to take the calendar and to take the existing faculty as sort of the seeds of UNBC and to recognize that in, within 12 months, we have to take that from a, from, from a fairly small number of seeds and grow it into a full-scale university. The temporary UNBC library is not waiting another year to open to the public, having opened its doors in September with about 30,000 volumes but the goal is to more than triple that number in one year. Well, at the moment we have, as you mentioned, 30,000 volumes catalogued, 
uh, we have uh, about 20,000 volumes of periodicals which are on the shelves, but we haven't actually cataloged them. They're available for use. Uh, we would be, our goal would be about 100,000 volumes when we go up the hill. Now, a lot of that is going to come through our vendors. Uh, fully cataloged, what have you. Probably another 30,000 will come through that source. Uh, we also will have, now that we have faculty, uh, they're putting in requests for materials. So we have a fair amount of material coming in specifically in response to uh, discipline needs. And we also have, we still have get, uh, gift material coming in. And I anticipate probably another 10,000, 15,000 volumes coming in by that way. So I think that we probably will have close to 100,000 volumes by the time we move up the hill. Uh, that's basically to get what we call this core uh, collection in place for the opening of the university, the opening of the major part of the university operation next year. UNBC, by its name, has a mandate to operate as a regional university in northern BC, and this year we'll see the announcing of regional academic plans and the hiring of regional faculty. What we need to be doing, uh, and are doing between now and, and the opening uh, next fall, is determining with some great precision exactly the courses and the programs to be offered in, uh, within the whole of the region. And that, uh, that is dependent upon a number of other things like most things are. Uh, the hiring of faculty uh, really in many ways determines the exact name of the course to be offered. So we'll uh, be recruiting faculty this, this coming year for uh, implementation the following year. And uh, discussions with the college has uh, been proceeding on the basis of a, a whole range of student services. The student services one normally expects and will be available on Cranbrook Hill of course will also be available to students studying at some of our other campus locations. And in every, every case, that means making arrangements with the, uh, with the community colleges within the region to provide the same level of service that we will be providing for students here in Prince George. The prime objective of, uh, of home delivery, in a sense, of taking courses and programs to students within the region we will deliver on that in a fashion, perhaps not as many locations as might, uh, we, might, we might like or people might like, but certainly we will deliver on the fact clearly that the university is the University of Northern BC and not only a university that happens to be in Prince George. The expectations uh, of UNBC are very high. Uh, we've seen a tremendous amount of construction and that has been in part triggered by the university. Um, I th think that uh, during the next year we'll see continued uh, growth in our, our residential development. We'll see uh, additional retail facilities in the community and, and different government investments. Uh, all of w at the same time, UNBC will be under construction. In fact, just off the access road to the UNBC campus, one of the newest housing developments in Prince George has sprung up almost overnight. I think we're stable. I, I really believe right now that we're really, really stable. Now, maybe next spring we'll see a, another big jump. I don't know, but I believe we're stable. And, and whether or not we're going to go further than that, I don't know. Like, I, I get surprised by the real estate market every year, so I, I don't like making uh, crystal ball predictions. <laughs> what do you think of when you see developments like this? Oh, it, it's great in most ways. I think it's really wonderful that people believe enough that they're out there building them. My hope is that they'll that there will be lots of people to buy them. There's a lot of big houses. I get a little bit worried sometimes that there's so many big ones over two hundred thousand dollars that will they all sell? But that's just my natural nature as being a realtor. You have to worry about those things a little bit. What your what your own vendors have in competition or whatever. So. Uh, I hope it'll all work out really well. I also hope that the builders will build a few more s smaller houses for the people that really want them. This is the banner year. This is, uh, in, a, in a sense, the founding year when we will take our first big intake of uh, students. We'll be taking between 12 and 1,500 uh, students. And, of course, I think that's really what everybody has been, has been waiting for when we, uh, when we take that first big block of 
students. And I think uh, many people will look back and say the fall of 1994 was when it all began, although, of course, there was a great deal of work before that. Do you think that it's going to be difficult to get that target of 1,500 students for next year? Personally, I did not at all. Um, from, from what I know, because I'm from the lower mainland, and I know it's just jam-packed to get in down there. And, uh, like, I think if, if it's, you know, advertised well, like, I, I don't see any problem because, it, you know, it's a great school and it's got some great staff. And especially with overflow down there, because, I mean, you, you know, it's Virgin, pretty soon you're going to need a 4.0 to get in down there. And I think for a lot of people it's sort of a, a good outlet for, you know, if you can't get in down there or if you can't get your courses, because I know that's another hard thing, is just even getting the courses you need if you are accepted. So, no, I, yeah, I think it'll easily get 1,500. My classes are really small right now. And, you know, it's amazing because you get, like, almost one-on-one -on -one contact with your professors. And that's huge. And for someone down at UBC, you know, it's really, you know, it's just so much better than, you know, sitting in the aisles in a lecture theater. So sort of the class size and, and I, it's hard to say, you know, it's kind of, uh, yeah, I'd say the campus and the staff, the classes, pretty much everything about it is just such a good deal that, you know, I don't see how anyone could resist. This year, this academic year is a very important year for UNBC. You simply cannot say, assume that the students are, 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 are a difficulty or a problem to be dealt with. They are our students. We will deal with them as well as we possibly can. We'll deal with as much respect and enthusiasm as we, we will deal with our students 15 to 20 years from now. And I'm convinced that the experience that these students have will be a primary service for us in convincing other students to come. It is already happening. Uh, we already have a number of students coming in and saying, boy, the way your registrar's office works is just wonderful. And I talked to the dean the other day, and boy, I, I tried to get that same service at another university, and I can't. And the faculty here are so enthusiastic and so energetic, and isn't that wonderful? Uh, so yes, I mean, this year is not just a practice year for us. This is a real year of UNBC service, of UNBC courses, of UNBC delivery. And I'm convinced that the exercise will convince other students to come and join us as well. I've only been here about two and a half weeks, and I'm sort of thinking that I could see myself staying up here. UNBC has hired about 40 academics so far, and that number will nearly quadruple by this time next year. Eventually, they'll be housed on the fourth floor of the library, but for now, they're stationed in temporary quarters. This month, we're introducing Annie Booth, Lee Keener, and Mary Louise McAllister. I'm very interested in the role citizens can play in participating in their communities, and I'm also interested in what I consider the most important area of government, unlike many others, and that's the local communities. I think environmental issues, economic issues, jobs, all of these issues uh, are, are play in the most important arena at the local level. If you don't have efficient uh, garbage disposal system, that's going to affect you a lot more than, say, the Berlin Wall coming down in terms of your own immediate environment. And I find that's the most interesting level of, of politics because that's where you're dealing with people. Coming from the Center for Resource Studies at Queen's University, Mary Louise McAllister is most interested in a process called integrated resource management which looks to balance often very different demands for the same resource. If you talked about Windy Craigie, the mining industry would say it didn't work, it was highly unsuccessful if you were talking to those people who were extremely concerned about preserving um, an ecosystem, uh, then they would say it was highly successful. I would suggest to you that a process that did work was one where as many people's concerns could be satisfied at, um, in the process that didn't actually shut out people but in a way made them feel that um, some of their interests were satisfied. I'm not sure that it's always going to be a win-win situation. I've come from Indiana University in South Bend. Uh, I was there for about 10 years. I was the chair of mathematics and computer science for three of those years. Uh, before that, I was a Dalhousie for, again, about 10 years. Um, I started my career at Dalhousie. So why come to UNBC now? Well, I think my reasons are, are not unique. Um, the opportunity to be involved in an enterprise like this of, is, is very rare these days, to be able to design your own curriculum. In fact, I've spent, uh, uh, I've spent many, many hours just thinking about this and planning for the day when <laughs> when I could have some role in, in, in starting a curriculum, from, uh, building it from scratch. And uh, 
it's, a, it's an exciting time. I'm really looking forward to it. Because programs like math and computer science are fairly well-defined disciplines, it's not so much what's taught as how it's taught that will make UNBC different. In the case of mathematics, uh, we're introducing uh, the use of, of uh, important mathematical software, the Maple mathematical software. Uh, this is something which is produced by the University of Waterloo. We're going to be using it in many of our courses. We're not uh, the only university in Canada that's doing this, but uh, uh, it's still kind of a pioneering effort. Uh, it makes, a, uh, I think, a real difference in the way a student perceives and the way a student learns. One thing in computer science maybe I should mention that uh, I'm quite anxious to implement is a, uh, a hardware laboratory modeled after uh, one I saw in the United States um, where students are given an opportunity to essentially build their own computer, a PDP-8 computer, from uh, low-level components. Uh, it's quite a challenging project. I interviewed a number of students uh, in the demonstration lab uh, and was very, very impressed with their enthusiasm. Uh, they thought this was an absolutely fantastic uh, plan. Uh, we will be able to purchase the technology from, uh, from this is actually Indiana University at Bloomington. Uh, they're willing to sell it for a very modest cost. We can probably uh, bring people in to help us set this thing up. So I'm, I'm very hopeful we'll be able to have a, a lab of this sort, perhaps even as early as the fall of 1994. This is absolutely state of the art um, in terms of the way that the course is structured and delivered. Uh, I don't think there's another, uh, another course in the world that's, that is any better than that. And if we, can, if we can introduce that here, it will be uh, of great value to our students. When I came out of UW, uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, I'd been teaching there for two years. And in the three-year period, we saw the two undergraduate courses go from an enrollment of 80 to 310 in two years. That's the sort of popularity. And we had a lot more that wanted to enroll and couldn't. And that's in one small or one large university, but you know, one university. And you're seeing that all over. Uh, I've seen a lot of environmental people trying to put environmental studies programs on, both in Canada and the U.S. And you know, some are doing it well, some are not doing it so well. It really depends. Here they're doing it very well. They're integrating it with the rest of the curriculum. They're really opening it up to a lot of different students. They're putting on graduate programs right away instead of trying to fit them in into a couple of other different degrees. And so... The class taught by Annie the Booth this semester is through. one of the most popular courses at UNBC popular in a region where natural resources are critical. The idea that natural resource isn't just an economic item or simply an item that uh, has a certain biological function. It fits in the society as a matrix. And so as an individual, as a member of society, as a member of a particular culture, you'll have certain understandings. And that's what we want to give people. They'll understand how the government deals with it. And they'll also understand how institutions, uh, the non-government uh, non organizations, also think about resources. And why you get such bitter uh, conflicts, such as over the logging in old growth forest. The process of hiring as many as 110 additional academic employees got underway in September as advertisements were placed in the major university publications for the remaining program chair and faculty positions. If the number of applications received for the initial 40 faculty positions is any indication, UNBC will receive thousands more applications in the next few weeks. Uh, in terms of numbers, um, our expectations right now are that we're going to be looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of six to 10,000 applications. That's obviously a very difficult number to be able to fine-tune, but our expectation right now is that that is uh, a level for a variety of reasons that are occurring in the industry. In terms of um, the other component, which is quality, we expect that to be very high as well. Uh, from Based on our, our hirings to date, we've had extremely strong responses, and uh, we are and in, in the ideal situation of being able to look at extremely well-qualified candidates for the positions that we'll be filling. Many of the faculty already hired are teaching in the Quick Start program, which began in early September. Nearly 240 students are registered, an increase of more than 300 percent over the registration numbers for last year's Quick Start program. Courses in Fort St. John are being offered at Burt Bowes Junior Secondary School as UNBC and the North Peace School District signed a facility use agreement in September. Superintendent Tom Lowney says the agreement is indicative of the cooperation already occurring between UNBC and School District Number 60.
As we've already heard on this edition of Spotlight on UNBC, preparations are continuing for the grand opening at UNBC in one year from now, and the nursing program is no exception. Reps of the nursing programs at Northern Lights College, Northwest Community College, the College of New Caledonia, and UNBC sat down for a full week recently to discuss how the program can be laddered between the colleges and the university. The community colleges will offer the first and second year of the nursing programs and maintain the diploma exit route. And the universities will offer year three and four. And then eventually, um, we'll get into graduate education at some date. And the university will have the mandate for the post-basic nursing education program. The provincial government uh, has mandated us to look very closely at preparing nurses uh, to some uh, level for rural health care. That's small hospital uh, settings as well as uh, rural community health. Um, they've also, of course, as you know, with uh, some of the closing of beds in hospitals uh, and uh, the hospitals themselves, for instance, Shaughnessy Hospital, uh, they're moving people from the uh, hospital settings into the community much sooner. So there's a particular kind of care that has to be developed around that. So we're looking at home care um, and uh, doing more with home care. And very few programs in the country are uh, pr uh, helping nurses to learn um, in a, in a fair amount of depth about home care. UNBC is hosting First Nations Forum number three in early November in Prince George. Look for a full report to appear on the next Spotlight on UNBC. $627,000. It's a lot of money and it's also the sum handed over by the provincial government recently to UNBC's scholarship and bursary fund, the North to the Future campaign. Here it is, Jeff. $627,086. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Universities ultimately are collections of people, uh, not of buildings. And though right now in Prince George we're a little preoccupied with buildings, um, in the long term it's the quality of staff and the quality of students that will make the University of Northern BC uh, a success or less than a success. And one of the things that you have to do to get that quality of student is open those doors to students who may not have the financial resources to attend a university uh, without some assistance. Finally, the presidents and vice presidents from all four BC universities were in Prince George recently to meet and tour the Cranbrook Hill campus. It was the first time the University Presidents Council had met outside of the Lower Mainland or Vancouver Island. Part of the challenge of building a regional university is trying to be everywhere at once. Now, obviously, that's not possible, but regional coordinators can be the university's eyes and ears in the various UNBC regions, including the South Central region. That region stretches from Burns Lake to the Alberta border and down to 100 Mile House. Ellen Facey is right. the regional yeah, coordinator exactly. and spoke exactly. about the challenges yes. of representing an area that large in her home base of Quinell. We are not forgetting the regions. That is really one of the more major messages that I hear consistently from one place to another. Uh, let us make sure that you don't forget us, that uh, programming is also going to come into the region uh, as things develop in Prince George, that they are also developing simultaneously uh, in all of the other communities that make up the area that the university covers. Probably one of the biggest challenges will be that both of us will be limited in what we can offer. We can't be all things to all people. And it will be really interesting to try to target our programming so that it not only complements each other but meets the broadest range of interest. I found that with the college when we started offering university level programs or just expanding and growing in general, then people want everything. And, <laughs> and you can't do that and it's hard when you can't give them everything. I've tried to reassure people that we are working to do everything that we can whether that comes short of their expectations in the end uh, is, is something that will have to be measured uh, maybe a few years from now. Uh, I don't think it's fair to think of uh, putting a watershed mark at the 1st of September or the 10th of September next year and say, well, how did we do? It's really over the next maybe 10 years that we can say, how did we do? There are a lot of programs that aren't even starting next fall, but we will be providing them a year or two or maybe three later. The roof of the library building offers a great view of the city of Prince George and the surrounding area, 
But some employees of the university had an even better view recently from 3,000 feet. You can, you'll notice when you do a turn, like if I get you to do a, a 360, um, you, you go down. Yeah, it's, it's just like a pendulum, you're kind of out there. But if you want to, if you hold it down twice, you'll go out, you'll start picking up speed going down. Hey, is this going to make it on Spotlight? Yes. Inspired by the chance to be on this program, members of the UNBC Adrenaline Club piled into perfectly good airplanes in July, only to jump out of them. Are you going up right now? You bet. First load. You got the first load. First load. What's your thoughts? It's been nice knowing you guys. What time Say hi to everybody at the university for me. Uh, uh, <laughs> What's going through your head? Arch. 1,000, <laughs> Barry's the licensed instructor, and I don't know how many students he's dropped. Dropped. Well, that's dropping the students, eh? Yeah. It's just the term we use, but um, in the last few years that I've been skydiving with him, probably I've seen him do somewhere between 600 and 1,000. Thank you for tuning in to this edition of Spotlight on UNBC as we count down one year to go until the start of full operations. When the next edition of Spotlight on UNBC airs in November, we'll be one month closer. My name is Rob Van and I'll see you next month. <laughs>